Okay, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to run through some of the lab for Chapter 8, uh, tree-based methods, uh, focusing on uh, random forest um, and boosting. We're going to start off with a single tree-based method, just to get a sense of uh, how that performs uh, and compare it to the ensemble methods. Okay, as usual, we have our some imports at the beginning, and then we have some new imports for this model, module, I should say. So um, the main methods we're going to talk about today are uh, random forest and boosting, and we're going to be doing regression. So that's why we're looking at random forest regressor and grading boost and regressor instead of classifier. Okay, we'll also talk a little bit about decision trees. We'll look at the decision tree regressor and there's the corresponding classifier, decision tree classifier. Okay, so fitting a classification or a regression tree, because, well, they're, again, methods from scikit-learn, they will, f they will you know, look almost identical to the methods we saw in Chapter 4 for classification. So once we form a set of features and, a, and, a, and an outcome, we'll just use the fit, fit and predict method. And similarly for cross-validation, like we saw in Chapter 6, because it's an SKLearn estimator, we can use the same kind of setup to do classification. So since we're going to focus on regression for random forest and boosting, we're going to jump to the part of fitting a regression decision tree rather than a classification decision tree. Again, they look diff uh, similar, the main difference being one is a binary outcome or a ca categorical outcome, and the other one is a continuous one. Okay, the data set we're going to use um, for regression today is the Boston data set we saw in Chapter 3. Um, and the preprocessing is pretty simple. We just have to find a set of features, um, and we'll do that by making a design matrix as if we were doing linear regression and just taking the design matrix. Though we don't want to include an intercept, so we're going to say intercept equals false because you know, the regression trees fit their own intercept and, well, it would be could be problematic having uh, uh, an intercept column in there. So regression trees, we're going to convert the design matrix to an array rather than a data frame. So we lose some of the um, some of the feature names, but these are the this is the um, preferred data format for fitting the regression tree. Okay, so for validation, we're going to split our data into training and test and fit on the training and evaluate on the test. We've seen this before. To construct a, to fit a regression tree, we first construct the estimator. And remember for scikit-learn, in forming the estimator, we give no data in this argument. We just sort of specify the hyperparameters of the method. Once we have constructed the estimator, we call the fit function. And after that, we can call predict function to, to predict on new outcomes. So one thing you know, slightly different about a tree is people sometimes want to visualize what a regression tree looks like. So there's this function plot tree that gives us a visual representation of the tree. And you can see some measure of a fit in each of the leaves. The resolution of this picture is not great. Um, and from also, you can sort of trace an observation down the regression tree. Whoops. Let's see if I can zoom in on this. So if the number of rooms is less than 6.8, we'll go to the left. And then the next variable checked is LSTAT, et cetera. And that's how, we, how the predictions are formed in a decision tree. So let's just um, let's, let's look at the, the accuracy of fitting this regression tree. So just for reference later, we see for using a regression tree, we get about a um, mean squared error of about 28. This mean squared error is for the here, quote, the best regression tree. And what is best here? Well, we didn't, I haven't mentioned it yet, but we, we show how to do um, the cost, compl cost complexity pruning path in this bit of code. So we've optimized this parameter on the training data to try and um, get a better estimator. And this is, according to that metric, the best estimator found with a mean squared error of, of about 28. This grid parameter we saw in uh, chapter 6 when we have a tuning parameter. This is a method, uh, generic method in scikit-learn you can use to tune a hyperparameter for an estimator. Right? This is our estimator regression. We specify some arguments to the, the 
the reg estimator, and then we vary that over the grid to get this best parameter. So just to summarize, the general uh, uh, procedure is to grow a bigger tree and then use cross-validation to determine how much to prune it back. In this case, um, and this was all done on the 70% of the, the data, which was training data, and then this final estimate of error for the, the optimally pruned tree is on the 30% of the data, which is test data, and we saw it, we see it's 20, just over 28. Okay, so that's using this, tuning this way is, is about as well as we can do with the single tree. And we're going to move on to, um, to ensemble methods. So the first ensemble method we'll talk about is bagging or, and or random forest. Remember, the main difference between bagging and random forest is random forest randomly um, has some randomization injected in which features are used for each tree. But remember, the basic, the basic scheme of bagging is, well, what it's, it's bagging stands for bootstrap aggregation. So a bootstrap sample is taken from the data. That's a sample with replacement. A tree is fit to that bootstrap sample. And then uh, the final estimator is the average of these, uh, these trees fit on each bootstrap sample. The random forest adds this wrinkle of um, not using every feature on every tree. So along with taking a random sample of the feature, of the of the rows of the data set, the cases, we also take a random sample of the features. Every time a split's taken, you take a sample of the features. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, yes. I th and I'm sure there are variations of this, but yes. OK. Um, <laughs> so uh, OK, uh, let's see. So how do we specify? Well, the random forest is a scikit-learn estimator. Uh, so once we construct the, the estimator using RF, this is our shorthand for random forest regressor. Um, well, we just have to call the fit method on the training data. Uh, that is X train and Y train. And then we can evaluate, we can predict on the test data and evaluate um, the accuracy that way. OK, and note here I've put uh, an argument random state equals 0. Because this is a random procedure, um, there is a random number generator underlying this. And setting the state means that the re results will be reproducible. So when we run this again, we'll get the same answer. If you don't specify a random state, then the results will change from run to run. OK. So just with that simple re regressor, we get a mean squared error um, of 14. That's about half that we had on a single tree. So we see that in terms of predictive performance, Ensemble methods, you know, without very much effort, really out, outdo a single tree very easily. So let's look. This is we've I've called this the bag version of the tree, and that's because of here I put in this note max features is the number of columns of X train, and that that um, essentially tells the. Uh, random force regressor to use every feature when it does a split. So it doesn't do any sampling um, uh, of features when it splits. If we made this smaller than the number of columns, which is 12, if we made it smaller, then we would, it would be a random forest. And uh, just a note for, for scikit-learn, the, the default number of features used for splits varies between the regressor random forest and the classification random forest. I think it's P, the default is, is to do bagging for regression, I believe, and square root of P, or square root of the numbers, for classification. OK. So the, another parameter you can specify in the random forest is the number of trees grown. The default is 100. We can, here, well, let's try increasing the number of trees to 500 and see if we do any better. We didn't really do any better. It's about 14.6. Um, and of course, what's happening here is that we're averaging the same, you know, independently drawn trees from the same distribution given the data. So at a certain point, averaging will kick in, and we will no, no longer see any improvement. But if we take too few trees, like a single tree, um, we will not achieve a, as high, a, a, as good a mean squared error, as, as low a mean squared error. OK, so if we want to have something more like a random forest, we can decrease the number of features. Here we set the number of features equal to 6. That's bigger than the square root of p, but um, it is, this will give us some 
selection of features for every split. And we see here that it actually degrades the performance a little bit. Uh, it's 20 instead of 14.6. Um, One of the nice things about random forests uh, is that you can you, there's a measure of importance for each feature that you can use to sort of you know, post hoc analyze which features seem to be important in, in producing these pr predictions. So remember, these are, um, this, this measures the sort of average improvement gained by whenever we added a split on ALSTAT, there's some improvement in mean squared error. And this is, the, uh, in some sense, the average improvement over whenever we had done a split in any of the trees. So it's, it's saying that uh, ELSTAT and, and number of rooms are by far the most important features, and all the rest seem to be much smaller in comparison. Yes, yeah, yeah. And that, that's, you know, if we w think back to that plot of our single tree, ELSTAT and room were also the first few features we split on, so right. the, these right. seem to be important for prediction here. Okay. So the other ensemble method that we'll talk about is boosting. And so if you, both boosting and random forest use a collection of trees. Uh, the, one, the big, one of the big differences between random forest and boosting is the type of trees fit at each stage. In random forest, uh, the, 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 at each stage, the, the, the tree fit is of the, the same as the first stage. Because you know, once we fix the data, a bootstrap sample at any given time is is this bootstrap sample at stage one is the same as the bootstrap sample at, at, at the 500th stage. In boosting, what happens, uh, there's, there, well, there can be resampling. It depends on the implementation. But what changes as you go through the, the stages is the, we're fitting trees to the residual after having removed some of the, the effect of the, up to that point, the, the, fitted, the fitted model. So, there's so, so Jonathan, unlike in, in random forest, where once you fit enough trees, things don't change. With boosting, the more trees you fit, the more you're going to start overfitting the data. Mm -hmm. And so there really is going to be a bias variance trade-off in the number of trees. That's right. And we'll see a plot of that um, coming up. We, yeah. as, a, as, a, as the number of estimators, that's the number of trees grows, we can plot both the, the test error and the training error. And we'll see, um, we'll see what comment, uh, Trevor just mentioned coming up. But in terms of fitting these models, uh, once we specify the hyperparameters again, since it's a sklearn method, it's we use the fit, the fit method um, to predict to fit on training data, and we can predict on test data. So let's make that plot of um, of error prediction of training error and test error as a function of tree. And to do that, we can use this this for the a, a boosting estimator. There's this thing called stage predict, which uh, as it's name suggests, uh, it predicts in stages. And the stages are as we go through the, tr the trees fit in the boosting process. So um, the residual changes and gets smaller as the, tr the, the training residual gets smaller as we go along the, the, uh, the stages. So the, the, the training error should go down. And at some point, test error will possibly go up. So let's just look at the plot. After 5,000 trees here, uh, we see training error has sort of begun to saturate. Um, we didn't see here that a, a real increase in overfitting on this data set, but that doesn't mean that boosting will never overfit. It's just on this particular data set, um, it has not. It's possible that we would see some uptick in test error as we grow the number of trees. In this data set, we do not. OK, so now let's take a look at our mean squared error on the test data at the final stage, and it's about 14.5, which is you know, just slightly better than random forest, but they're very comparable here. Then the bagging version. Oh, the bagging version yeah. of random forest, that's right. Yeah. OK. Yeah. yeah. OK. So the last um, thing we could talk about is there's this, there are other parameters. And f if you look at the, the help for GBR, you'll see Many parameters you can set, um, one of them being the learning rate. And here we just um, change the learning rate just for, for to show you that you can change several things on, on the, the boosting estimator. And well, actually, in this case, it does not make a difference. That doesn't mean it will never make a difference. But there are a huge number of tuning effect, tuning parameters. And I think some implementation of boosting also do, do some resampling as well as mm -hmm. they go along. So, But the, the general flavor of boosting is fitting a tree to residual, 
compared to the general flavor of random forests, which is fitting you know, an identical tree to some randomized version of the data at every stage. Um, beyond that, there are different details uh, in their implementation. Okay. Yeah. We're not going to, uh, the, the final topic here is Bayesian additive regression trees. We're not going to go in, we're not going <laughs> to. We're not going to talk about those. <laughs> and <laughs> this is a good place to, to wrap up the lab for chapter eight. <laughs> Thank okay. you.